Hello, everyone. Just a second. I think I can press. Is that the button that I can press? Hey, look at that. Advanced. All right, hi. <laughs> uh, uh, can everybody hear me clearly? Because sometimes I tend to drift away from the mic. So I have been told I have a uh, piercing voice that's not unlike lemon grab. So <laughs> <laughs> let's keep moving forwards. So, <clears throat> my name's Edward Blanche. I'm a technical artist for Tin Man Games. I'm also a, the creative director of Considerable Content, um, my own games company that I run uh, with uh, Scott Becker, um, who's a programmer. And um, I have recently, in the last couple of years, shifted from being an artist to basically being a technical artist. Um, and that's really what, sort of like the, the basis of the talk today is just gonna be me really talking about uh, making sure that when you pick a style and a tone and a structure for your game and your art, that you're really thinking about your pipeline, the way that it integrates. You ideally want your art style to be working for you, not so that you have to either be consistently working against it or alternatively having to be putting in an unreal amount of time in order to support something that isn't supporting you or supporting your goals, essentially. So my background is actually in architecture. Um, I studied architecture at university, doing a uh, undergraduate in uh, architectural studies, and I did a postgraduate uh, masters of architecture before I got into video games. So I come from a very design-oriented background, but obviously somewhat of a different background from uh, a lot of people in this room. Um, so how many people here are artists? Woohoo! So most of us. Great. Who here is a programmer? Oh, great. So we've got here. All right, good. And who here is a producer or a um, kind of maybe social media or I guess we could say all other. <laughs> oh, wait. Oh, good. So we've got a bunch. All right. Let me just set up a stopwatch so I don't run too late. All right. Awesome. So three of the projects that I released this year or was uh, very uh, involved in uh, this year was a the early access release of Rogue Singularity. That's the uh, game that considerable content has been working on. Uh, a Warhammer 40k game on mobile called uh, Legacy of Oblivion, and uh, Warlock of Firetop Mountain, which is a um, large-ish uh, kind of um, adaptation of an 80s uh, game book adventure. These were these. Um, books where you kind of choose your own adventure book, but you roll dice and you would uh, go through combat in order to decide where you turn the page. And we updated that. So in all three projects, which all uh, released this year, I was the key uh, person in charge of doing pretty much most, if not all art assets associated with them, as well as getting them in the game uh, technologically, which as you could imagine, puts quite a lot of pressure when you're one person and all of a sudden you end up as the bottleneck in a project. So this is Warlock of Firetop Mountain, where we had uh, combat systems, small characters on bases, um, and obviously, as you can see, it was a uh, 3D game that recently came out on PC, Mac, and Linux. It's on Steam. It's, we're doing the iOS work on it now as well. Uh, Herald of Oblivion was a iOS text-based game, but required a lot of UI assets as well as a lot of 3D models for their uh, monster designs in there. And Rogue Singularity, which is a uh, 3D uh, procedurally generated platformer in the mold of uh, Spelunky. So, huh, look at that, I've left some default text on there. Um, <laughs> note to self, when you're you know, doing it the night before, check that, the, um, that your uh, template, you might want to delete your template notes. All right, so. The thing that I really like to talk about is I like to talk about style as being a function of tone associated with the game that you're trying to create. This is probably the most important starting point that you start with with almost all things in which your design choices really need to be focused on the tone and that the game is trying to set. So in this particular context, you think about, well, is, the, is it supposed to be humorous? Is it supposed to be lighthearted? Is it supposed to be dark and dank? Is it supposed to be set in the future or the past? Or the... These decisions end up framing a lot of the decisions that you'll be making as you go down through the design process and start to iterate on it. 
because really your artistic choices are going to cover everything from color through to lighting, through to uh, tone, technology. All of these elements are really going to be affected by the tone that you choose to start producing things in. And this is something that will shift and evolve over time, but it is a thought you need to start thinking about really early on when you're developing your game. I've seen a few games that have gone um, into production where they didn't really have a consistent tone before they had started producing assets associated with the game. And you can quite often end up, things will feel like they don't fit properly. And you can end up really headbutting yourself against the wall as you try and work out why these two things that both look individually good don't seem to look very good together when they're put together. Things can end up feeling very um, out of that. So this is the thing that I always talk about, which is tone ends up being really a heavy foundation of the way that the entire game will end up working. And again, if you are an artist, this is something you need to be talking about with, with your design and development team, which is, well, what is this game trying to do? One of the things that is quite interesting about it is that you think about all game art as being representative of something. So obviously, if you are building a 3D prop of a chair in a game, it's not actually really a chair. Nobody has to sit on it. It's not going to do that. So what a chair is, is it's the symbol of a chair. It's the representation of a chair. And this is when I talk about style and tone, when I suggest what, what through the creation of this particular asset, is the chair trying to achieve? And this becomes really important when you start to think about how many assets you're going to need to put in the game, how frequently they're going to be there, how the players are going to be interacting with them, because these art decisions will end up coming back to bite you pretty heavily if your basis for everything is, well, everything needs to be realistic and everything needs to look perfect. You're going to end up drowning very quickly uh, if you realize that your eight your 20,000 polygon main character requires the same depth and detail as your chair that a player is going to be walking past in about two seconds. Now, this is a very particular kind of angle with which that I'm coming at this. So this is to, this is to say that the way that I'm going to be talking about this isn't the only way to approach doing art and, and uh, different design tasks. But it's a way that I found really important because I've had to work on a lot of exercises that are extremely tight on time, a budget, where I've ended up as the sole um, um, bottleneck in a lot of projects. And so we've had to come up with ways in which we can improve. So this is one of the things that I talk about. Now, I have heard a few people when they talk about their project, they've got a design, they've got it all kind of gray boxed out, and they're like, oh, we'll make it look good at the end. We'll make it look pretty. We'll add the pretty. And I always tend to be of this, well, if you leave it too late, you're going to end up in really big trouble if you're not planning ahead for how you're going to start getting that content in, how you're going to be getting those assets in. Especially if you're an artist, you need to be thinking about what tools do I have at hand that are going to help speed up this process if I'm going to have to do something 10 times, am I going to create myself a way of being able to do that in a clean and a neat way? So in Warlock of Firetop Mountain, we had a big challenge ahead of us. One of which is that this game contains over 130 to 140 enemies in it. It's a massive amount of monsters, a massive amount of underground dungeons that had to be built. We had to expand on the original game. We had sets of extra characters and we were a team of about five or six people. So it was going to be a gargantuan task if we made decisions early on that were going to commit us to uh, having to drag the, the, the weight of a full sort of AAA development style budget behind us, which we just didn't have. It would have been a disaster. So when we started thinking about the tone the game needed to capture, what we started thinking of was what are ways that we can represent this game that would make sense to the audience, that would also allow us to have an art pipeline and budget that would make sense. So what we settled on is we talked about, well, these books were really um, how to learn how to be a dungeon master. They were how to learn how to play Dungeons and Dragons back because these were produced around very similar time to sort of the original series of Dungeons and Dragons. So we decided to look at the concept of a tabletop game as if you were playing a Dungeons and Dragons game uh, with actual miniatures. And we thought about this for a number of reasons, one of which is we didn't have the budget to animate. So we really had to think about, well, how can we allow our style to assist us in not having animation? Because we're not going to be able to afford it. It's going to be 130 monsters of a huge variety of types, and they've got one person, and I can only model so fast. 
And that didn't even include all the rest of the dungeons. Then we had to think about things like, well, we're going to have to create all of these assets and we're going to have to create all of these um, objects and put them in the game. So how do we want to try and make this quick go quicker? And so one of the things that we decided to look at was we were like, well, given that what we're trying to capture is a sense of authenticity, why don't we get some real miniatures, actual small handcrafted miniatures and scan them in using a high quality 3D scanner and paint them as though they were real miniatures in real life. So what we did is we looked at actual painting techniques in order to paint the little miniatures. We looked at the ways in which we could scan them at very high quality, whether we'd paint them outside of and then scan them in. In the end, what we ended up doing is we looked at, we um, loaned a $3,000 scanner and we started scanning them in. It took about an hour to do each scan. It would give us a point cloud of extremely high detail, but quite messy. We then ran it through a number of mathematical processes to turn it into a final mesh. We brought it into ZBrush where we painted them and using the exact same techniques as we would use if we were doing it. Again, this goes down to tone. It would have been quite unusual if we had chosen to texture our little um, miniatures with real textures because it would, again, you would have clashed. It may have made them look better, but it wouldn't make sense for what we were trying to create. It also speed up. It allowed us to increase the speed of the process by painting them. And then what we did is we created, uh, we got a bunch of programs to help us automatically create high quality unwraps without um, causing us to have any stretching or any loss of uh, detail in terms of those. And we output them into the game. And this process ended up allowing us to put so many monsters and so much rich detail in the game without wasting time on elements that while potentially having added something to the project could have sunk us. Again, things like having to do animations, uh, things having to do with as soon as you put characters in, you have to think about what they're doing when they're idling. You have to think about what happens when they're, what, how are they navigating uh, the surfaces of the game that you're creating. And you can open yourself a can of worms. We use the same technology in Herald of Oblivion. So let me. So yes, again, this is the uh, point that I was making. You can't wait until you're too deep into production to start making it look good. And you really need to start thinking about what look good means as well. You've got to find out where your standard is and for what you want. So one of the things that I do is I constantly, uh, on Imga, on uh, Tumblr, on DeviantArt, I'm downloading images, styles, I'm downloading color palettes, I'm constantly trying to think about different ways. I literally have a folder in my uh, computer called Styles to Try. And it's just full of different things where each one I can piece out all of the different elements and think to myself, well, look how effective this image is being just using four colors and simple shapes. Look how effective this is being using these six concepts and this structure. That can end up, again, making your life really easy when you start to think, well, I could create really emotive characters very quickly. This is the thing. So what are your strengths? This is something that I really looked at when we did uh, working on Rogue Singularity, which is... What are the strengths that I can bring to the bring to the game to allow us to work efficiently? So I am a modeler and I do a little bit of sculpting. They're not necessarily my strongest elements though. And I don't always necessarily work as fast as I would like either. So in these particular ones, I needed to really think about where my strengths lie. And in this particular context, it is that I have spent the last couple of years learning how to do shader programming. And I was able to create a lot of different shaders and a lot of different uh, technical elements to speed up the process and help improve what I was doing. Again, what, for, especially for elements in the game that were things like uh, the platforms that you ran on and a lot of the objects that were around the world, I wanted to look for ways to reduce the time spent unwrapping the time spent on um, constructing them and carefully tweaking them. I wanted to try and be able to tweak as many of them in engine. So I did a, lot of, uh, did a lot of work in creating some triplanar textured shaders so that when I brought in objects, they would be automatically uh, textured. They would all have consistent world texture coordinates. And by that, I mean they would have exactly the same texture sizes. No matter where they were in the world, each piece would match to the other. I could intersect them and you would not see the line of intersection because the textures would perfectly smoothly uh, slide across the top. And this is a really important thing to start thinking about. So I know there's a lot of people, who's here had to sit and watch your computer do nothing but light bake? <laughs> it can be absolutely frustrating. 
And I know Unity is doing a lot to try and improve that, and Unreal is doing a lot to try and improve your light bake times, but I have heard stories and I have seen projects get killed because they just cannot iterate fast enough because every time they touch it, it requires another three days of light baking. This sort of even gets worse when you start getting um, uh, um, real-time global illumination changes because it means that if this floor is no longer red, it means the, the walls are now no longer have a little bit of red on them, which means they're not reflecting onto this, which means this changes and you get a cascade where you have to rebake your entire scene, you have to rebake all of your individual light probes. This is one of the really important things. You need to think about, well, how fast do we need to turn around? How can we construct this without having to do these elements? I tend to be on the side of, I like to do my projects with as little light baking as possible. Uh, because again, small teams, small budgets, we don't have the time to uh, bring production to a halt in order to re-light bake. Just, again, with uh, Warlock of Firetop Mountain, we did a lot of tricks to try and make sure that we didn't have to light bake because we did the original light bakes. Uh, they worked reasonably well. They took a while, but they were doable. Unity upgraded right in the middle of that our lighting solution and we went from um, Beast to Enlighten and the light bakes all of a sudden spiked in time. So it, we went from looking at a couple hours to bake a scene to looking at like five or 10 hours to bake it. And this was small areas in the project. It's gotten a little better since, but at the time we had to ditch it because we were like, we can't make that work. By time we've done this whole project and the entire game is in, it's going to be taking us upwards of a day to light bake this area properly. And again, with programs like Enlighten, they didn't have the options to be able to do draft bakes or things to try and reduce the time load on that. And we didn't have the option at the time of being able to set up online rendering. So this becomes a really important component. When you're starting out your art styles, when you're starting out your experiments, start looking at how it's going to look. Start thinking about things like, well, are my objects going to need ambient occlusion between the intersections? Uh, what, how are we going to be able to see this geometry? I love the next gen workflow, but it is expensive and it is time consuming. And a lot of people sometimes don't think about this, especially if you're um, wading hip deep into a really big project with a small team and a small amount of time. For even the simplest objects, you often require a high poly model, a low poly model, often you need a UV shell, then you need to create a high quality UV map, you need to apply the base textures, you need to create your roughness maps, your albedo maps, your metallic maps, there's a lot of programs that can really help you. I really recommend using Substance Designer if you're going down this route because it will save you so much time. And this is gonna to come to something that's really, 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 really important. You need time, 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 time. Tools are your absolute best friend. There's absolutely no reason to ever turn your nose up at a tool. If it's gonna save you time, if it's gonna make something easier, go for it. Not only that, you can use tools as a starting point for what you need. Are you gonna be doing a high quality uh, character skin and rig? Go get a shitty skinning program, even throw it up to Mixamo, bring it back down, you've got a base skin. Now start working on it, start improving it, but it will save you that base time of where you're like, well, I just need to get something working for now, and then I can start iterating and improving on it. If you spend too much time trying to make everything look perfect the first time, again, you're gonna end up wasting a lot of time and assets. A great story is from the creation of Half-Life, where they were creating, the, it's in a, um, actually a very interesting book whose name that I've forgotten off the top of my head, but they talk about how they came to um, the way that the original game looked. So originally it was much more like Doom, which it had sort of like, you know, floating weapons and, and much more sparse corridors and what have you. They were trying to build it and it just wasn't working and nothing seemed to be filling in and nothing seemed to be feeling right until apparently they took all the props they had and put them all in one room and then all of a sudden the game came to life and they realized, shit, that's what we have to do. We need it to, we need shelves and objects and, and bits and pieces and we have to give it life. And you can start to think about, well, if that was you and your game wasn't looking great and it wasn't feeling great and every single object you needed to put in it was gonna cost you $1,000 to make and now all of a sudden you've realized you're gonna need twice or three times as many objects as you thought, again, you're gonna find yourselves uh, in real trouble. So again, Rogue Singularity, a lot of the decisions we made in this game were really based around what we were able to do and what we weren't able to do. So in our game, all of the main characters are robots. We actually chose this after a discussion with a uh, animator from 
I believe, Blizzard uh, at GDC. Well, in fact, uh, we had we were out at a networking evening and drinking, and he gave us a really good piece of advice, and he said, don't make it a human. Why not? Well, you don't have the animation budget. And if it's a human, people are going to spot that it looks weird. They're going to spot that it looks robotic. If it's going to look weird and robotic, make it a robot. And that way, your art style will help your workflows to be able to work. So we went, you know what? We'll make it about robots. And so you can see how very quickly the early decisions we're making about the style, about the tone of the game, really came to assist us. So when we had our crappy animations, when things weren't quite working, it really, really assisted us with the fact that it's a robot, it's going to look a little mechanical when he's running, it's going to look a little mechanical uh, when he's doing things. Again, robots don't require rigging or skinning in the same way. They're literally robots, so we didn't need to have skins on them, we didn't need to have rigs on them. So we literally did individual parts that were rigged to just a normal skeleton. Got even more exciting. We have a character customization system. It made it so easy. Now we just have different head pieces. We have different arm pieces. We have different body pieces. We have different leg pieces. This way we were able to save a lot of money and we were able to really, really get more out of less. If we'd done it as a human, we wouldn't have gotten the benefit that we needed from it. We did procedural generation. One of the reasons why we did this is because neither of us was particularly good at level design um, and neither of us had the time to iterate over it. But one of the things that we did have experience was, was both of us had experience doing procedural generation before. And what we could do is we could tweak procedural generation much, much more effectively than we could otherwise. The original project this one started from was a project called uh, Postman's Odyssey. And what we were creating in that game was large complex environments that were interesting and difficult to traverse. And we were creating these towers that would, that would construct themselves almost like a tree. And we found that they were very interesting to clamber around and find different routes and the way that they interconnected was very interesting. So we thought, let's take that component that worked from the previous one, the most positive uh, experiences people had with it, and let's expand it. Because we know that this is an element that we managed to get working, that we got people playing and that those people enjoyed. Because we found in that original one that what we had built, the pre-constructed stuff we had built was falling flat. The procedurally generated stuff that we had built was uh, getting a much more positive response out of our players. And so we thought, let's go down that route because uh, we're starting to have uh, better luck in that particular area. Be careful though, procedural generation does not solve level design problems. <laughs> Trust me on this. <laughs> so it's gonna take a lot of iteration and a lot of work to continue to practice and get feedback. That's always the important thing. Feedback, get people playing it. We also made everything super metallic. We're robots, we can be metal, but we also managed to do it so we removed a lot of the need for UV maps and high quality textures on our uh, assets. And this was because, again, we could save a lot of time and a lot of money. Both me and my business partner have full and part-time jobs. So we can't work on our game full-time. We would really like to, but we can't. I would love to be able to sit down and carefully handcraft a beautiful robot and handcraft every high quality texture and thing in there, but the game will never come out and it will just end up as a black hole of money. So we also managed to simplify our robots down to really simple shapes. Just because we wanted things to be bright, we wanted them to be clear, we wanted them to pop out, to be understandable, and it saved us a lot of money on outsourcing. We could go to our outsourcers and we could say, look, we need a really simple set of body parts, give us five, they need to fall under these categories. We gave them our sample models saying, here is the exact naming system, here are the naming conventions, here's the uh, sizes, here are the poly counts. This will go a long way to trying to improve your uh, budgets when you're outsourcing. Even when you're bringing in your own artists, you really have to think about what you're gonna be asking of them, how quickly you can get stuff in there and turn them around. Because if you're trying to do a large project, you will eventually find yourself needing to pay someone to do stuff for you. <laughs> You're not going to be able to do everything. So these design decisions that you make really early on are going to be really important in terms of supp supporting the performance targets for your game that you're trying to go to. It will support the devices you're trying to target. It will really affect the type of skills that you have available to you, the scope of the project that you can do. All of these decisions are going to be really important in pre-production. There are so many examples of tool chains I've seen that are terrible, that take hours. I am in love with 
my own tool chains that we've created for Rogue Singularity because the tool chains we have for our other project, Warlock of Firetop Mountain, now that I'm using them post-release, you can feel the difference. You can feel the friction it takes to get every new thing in. Uh, uh, Rogue Singularity is currently in early access, so we are committed to doing updates regularly, and we need to be able to get those in the game quickly and easily because otherwise we are going to upset our community, the game is going to languish, and people are going to stop caring. So this is what happens in terms of, so here's what we did with uh, the Warhammer 40K game. So again, what we decided to do is we chose a tone. So we said, look, it's grim dark. Everything in the Warhammer 40K universe seems to be these old like green CRT monitors. So let's do that because it can support everything that we need to do. So we took, uh, we got um, our working with Games Workshop, we managed to look at using their um, miniatures as a way of scanning them in and getting them working. We created render techniques to make them look like holograms rather than look like real objects. This way we didn't have to color them. They could really support what we were doing. We would get a larger number of them and everything would remain visually consistent and would work for the overall tone of the game. Again, because it was mainly a text-based adventure, these elements really couldn't be too expensive because this was not what the player spent most of their time doing. Um, and if we sank our budget into making this highly animated and highly um, and uh, what have you, it would have ended up again. We turned this project in around in about two months. We already had the base engine for it, for the text. We needed to design all of the UI, the new combat system, and we had to get all of these models and miniatures in. There's about 90 of these different monsters in that game. And we got them all in in very short order, and it was very successful actually for in terms of that. Why are you doing that? Look at that. <laughs> Tim. Tim. Tim, money and opportunity. <laughs> My best friends. So Tim, this is I always kind of like think about as my design triangle. Now, I have had a few people criticize it, understandably. I agree with some of the criticisms associated with it, but these are the three concepts that, having worked on three sort of large projects where I'm trying to manage budgets, when I'm trying to manage outsources, I'm trying to manage my own time, you will always, always, always end up coming back to these three points continuously and without end. How much is it going to cost? How long is it going to take? What are we sacrificing to do this? So originally it was time, money, and luck, but I got rid of luck because opportunity is actually probably a larger element of this particular triangle. If you're running late, what are you missing? What opportunities are you missing because your project is running late and it's not hitting out at the right time? If you're spending, if the opportunity is right, how much money is it going to take you to get the game out if you don't have the time? It always ends up becoming a really element. Who in your team has experience? This is a factor of time. Or are you going to have to learn all of those lessons again? And that's going to take time. This is always something that it comes back to and people are unprepared for. Because, for instance, under the opportunity, your time is worth money too. It's very easy not to value your time and you will make big budgeting mistakes as a consequence of it. You'll be like, well, you know, my time's not worth anything, so I can just put these assets in. But then you've got bad, bad opportunities can happen. Maybe your kid needs braces or all of a sudden you find that you have to move house and you've lost your ability to do it and you're going to need someone to fill in for you. How much did you cost? Because you might have to fill your own role. And that if you're producing assets that are costing thousands of dollars and you knew that you were practically free for your company's costing, that means that you have a potential liability if you go down or if you're unable to finish your work that you're going to have to try and fill that hole. And you're really going to have to think about the decisions that you're making when you start to make them. Otherwise, again, you're going to get yourself into problems. This is why I'm always talking about pre-production, why I'm talking about thinking about your asset pipelines. How are you getting your models into the game? How are you synchronizing them so that they remain um, consistent, so that you can update, so that you can iterate quickly? Are you keeping your project versioned and backed up? This is something I know that artists should do more often. <laughs> I, who here has Dropbox? Who here uses SVN or another program like Git or something? Well, obviously a lot of the programmers and what have you. Who doesn't use a versioning of any kind? <laughs> Very brave of you, sir. <laughs> One of the things a lot of people don't realize is Dropbox does keep a short version history of your files. It only goes back about a week, 
But if something goes catastrophically wrong, sometimes you can restore from a backup. Also, you should be putting stuff into Dropbox because you don't want to lose it. Computers die. They die, 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 die. So you have to be so careful to make sure that your work is being backed up. If at all possible, make sure it's being versioned. Make sure that your programmers are keeping an eye on your repositories, keeping all of the work in there. These are just things that are super important. So this is the process uh, considerable content t tends to use. Probably about a third of our time was spent in pre-production. We were creating tools, we were creating the ways of creating the game, the ways of getting our assets in there. And then when we actually made the game, it was a case of iteration. We would do it again and again and again and again. And what was amazing about this was we were able to do it fast. We were able to do it quickly. We could add new assets in. We could get assets out very quickly. When we needed to regenerate a new level, all we had to do is press a button and it would re-add all the assets we wanted into there. We have configs for every level. We have prefabs for every item that needs to go in there. We created debug objects so we could see them in the game, so we could see how everything was working. We weren't just waiting for it to happen by magic. So it's really important to think about your tool chains when you're trying to go into full production because you want to iterate, you want to fix, you want to practice, you want to get feedback. And if it takes, again, if it's going to take three days to re-light bake every time you want to make a level design change, then that means your iteration time is three days at, at its best. And then you want to polish. And iteration and polish are very, very similar processes. You want to take out what's not working, you want to clean it up, you want to improve it. And again, if you have a tool chain that can support that, then it's going to be much easier to do that as the end of the project comes near because it's going to become harder and harder. You're going to become more compressed for time. Be careful of asset packs. They are very, very tempting, but they can land you in so much hot water. Specifically because, and I've seen this happen to a couple of people, <clears throat> you cannot realize how expensive the assets in the pack that you were buying were. So in some cases, you're going to realize that um, you need more assets and they need to match the style of the game you've been making. But the reason why those assets were cheap is because they were being sold to a lot of people. If you need that bespoke asset made for you, you can end up in trouble. Again, you can end up with a mismatch. You can end up with one asset that is clearly lower quality than all the others. And very quickly, you begin to start to slide down that quality curve. Sometimes the quality curve is really comes from assets mismatching and styles not working can make your work end up looking and your game looking up a lot more qualitatively poorer than it is in reality because you didn't choose a style and a tone that you could capture. Instead, what you did is you tried to shoot for the moon on every asset and each one sort of was hit and miss and hit and miss and you end up with just sort of a polyglot game that doesn't look right. If you are going to look at using asset packs, Plan it out. You need to know every asset that you're going to need in your game because you're not going to really be able to experiment with it. You're not going to have to expect uh, that they're going to, everything's going to be there. And you're going to have to remember that some of those asset packs are not created in a really nice way. So I tease them with, I tease with asset packs all the time. I don't necessarily use them, but they provide me a great basis to work from. They provide me some just default work so that I can start working and getting stuff done, but they can come in terribly. This is a uh, little sort of horror game that I was working on in my spare time. I downloaded a house asset pack because I just needed a house that I could use. This is a, a cupboard set that's made up of mostly wood. And this person has six materials for it for each separate section. I, I looked at the flashlight he supplied with the asset pack, five materials for a flashlight. <laughs> Now, the quality of the assets was decent, but the way they were constructed was terrible, like terrible, terrible, terrible. Each asset, and all on its own, had just baffling decisions. Not only are those five or six materials um, for that object alone, but not only that, the same wood has a different material for two different objects. I can't even combine all of the woods together. So just be careful. You'll... you'll it will come back to haunt you if you make some of those uh, mistakes. So yeah, if you're going to use asset packs, know what you're going to need, have a plan of how you're going to do it, what you're going to do when you run out, and remember there's always, always, always a cost. So this is something that I like to harp on too, which is making things look different. The reason why you're going to feel like you're in level 2 and not level 1 is because level 2 looks different from level 1. The reason why you know you're outside of the house is because outside the house looks different from inside the house. 
This is something to be really careful on, and especially exploration games get brought up on this problem a lot. If there's only one environment to explore, people are going to become very quickly ground down and feel like there isn't anything else to explore. So if you want to create a game that's really about um, a sense of progression and moving forward and what have you, you're really going to have to think about how you can make the player feel like things are being visually different. And again, this comes down to pre-production, it comes down to process. How easy is it to reskin your assets so they look different? How easy is it to make them so they feel meaningfully different? If you've got rocks in your game, can they look like different rocks? Can you make them look like lava rocks? Can you make them look like they're made of ice? These become really important because all of a sudden you realize you need to make another zone and how much is it going to cost you to do this? How can you make your life easier to do this? Again, these are really important and you want your art style at every step to assist you in this process. You want to be able to say, I'm going to turn this rock into an ice cube now. And now I've got an ice level and I can use all the rocks that I've used up until this point. They're ice cubes. The thing looks great. We did it in a short period of time and we allowed our art style to work for us, to constantly provide us value for every decision that we made when we were going into it. Yep. So there. So in Rogue, we really put a lot of time and effort into thinking about how we would use color. Each environment has a specific color palette associated with it. We're looking at going with uh, blues and reds and um, using caustics on platforms. But in a lot of these cases, they're actually very similar or not the same assets that have been reskinned. And it actually ends up being quite effective and quite cheap. We're going to be keeping iterating on this to make them look and feel even more different. But it ended up being uh, a nice. Uh, effect for that. So this is just a quick look into uh, one of our scenes that we use to set up all of our stuff. So this is where tools for pre-production becomes really useful. What you're seeing here is all of the platforms and the pieces that construct a level for one of our uh, levels in the game. So what we have is we have all of our pieces. They're linked into single chunks. Those little green things you can see. Let's see if we've got a Oh, no, I don't have a good image of it. Anyway, those little green things are actually arrows telling us where one piece can connect to another. So I can press a button and I can see where all of the things that we've set up for them, just at a visual glance, I can see where things might be going wrong. I can see where we need more connections. I can see where enemies can spawn on those platforms. This can be like when you're creating objects that have a real meaningful impact, when they're debug objects, try and make them look like something so that you can see them when you're going through that creation process. If we need to add a new level, in a new platform into this game, all I need to do is drop in some geometry, I press a button, I add the links where I want them, and I press go, and it's straight in. So we can test, we can iterate very quickly. If I want to create a new zone that uses the same pieces but different enemies, I can create a new config, I can drop all of those pieces into it, and then add new stuff to it. It makes it really quick, really aggressive for us to be able to work because we don't have the time to be spending a lot of time carefully setting stuff up. Tools, 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 tools. You will never ever regret a good tool. I've never done it. And don't wait. Don't wait until it becomes a problem. If you know that you're going to have to be doing something a lot, get the tool for it straight away because it will save you so much time. When we were doing uh, Warlock of Firetop Mountain, we found ourselves a nice tool for automatically unwrapping our complicated shapes. They weren't symmetrical, they were often scans, so they had weird geometric constructions. And so rather than trying to unwrap them ourselves, we got a tool to do it, and it paid off so much through the project. We still had to tweak it, we still had to improve upon what was being done, but just the ability to get a basic unwrap out of it that was of decent quality, don't wait for other programs to do it, like ZBrush, its unwrap is like just the worst. <laughs> It's, it's, it works in some circumstances, in other circumstances it's a nightmare, it doesn't make any sense, it constantly stretches things, you don't have consistent um, depth of your um, resolution. So one of the things is we wanted something that because these models are being painted, we wanted to have consistent depth, consistent resolution across the line and we found a really good program to do that. And especially because they were such odd shapes, it was going to be a nightmare to unwrap them. They, there was no quads, there was no loops, there was no strips, there was nothing to make our lives easier. So. And it paid off. It was, a, it was expensive, cost us a couple hundred dollars to get in there. If you're a small studio, that can be an expense that you don't want to have to pay. But then how much is my time worth? It saved me hours and hours and hours and hours and hours. You'll never regret it. In um, 3ds Max, this is a tool chain that is an adaptation of uh, a tool chain that was shown to me by um, 
uh, Matt Ditton, and it allows me to synchronize all of my assets to my project. It's an incredibly useful thing. So it's a big Mac script. What I do is I can select all my pro see objects in my scene. They can be named. I can export them with the click of a button. I can set them to what folders they're going to go into my project. I can make sure they stay synchronized. Again, we have these big asset scenes, hundreds of assets in them, and I use it to constantly manage and make sure that everything is connected with where it needs to go. Because otherwise your projects are going to get messy. You're going to leave stuff in there that you don't want. Things are going to get disorganized and you're not going to be able to iterate quickly. Right now I have a one click iteration. I go into my 3D file, I add something, I tweak something, I press a button, it's in the game. Our entire tool chain is set up so that it will update all along the line. So I can then, instead of, I don't even need to go in and check it, I can press play and it will be in there and it will be running. This is an incredibly important part of art. If you're a, if you are a programmer and you're working with an art team, this is the sort of thing you really need to be thinking about for your artists. You want to make it so that they can just fix things and they can fix things quickly. What are you paying for your contractors to do? Really think about what you're spending money and time on them doing. Is it something that you could do in-house cheaper and you want them to do things outside of house? So in our contractors, we got them to set up their robot models, got some nice, really nice models out of them, and then we subdivided them and created the materials on them because it was going to be quicker. We didn't want to have to teach them how to do it. We didn't want to have to faff around and go back and forth. It was a better spend of our money to use our art resources to do it rather than use the outsources. Again, we did that with our outsourcers on Warlock of Firetop Mountain. When we had outsourced props, we did the unwrapping, we did the game integration. We didn't want to waste the money on having them do something that we had good internal processes to do. Again, we talk about this in terms of what, how are your um, artists going to be working with your project? Do you want them working in your, in your actual project in SVN? Do you want them spending time and charging you for it? to check it into the project, to get things working. This is somewhere that you don't need a human to do in many cases. You can create a tool to do it, and that way you can make sure that when you're paying somebody to do something, you're paying them to do the thing. Not spend, you do not want to pay them to be faffing around with your shitty tools to take hours to get it into a project. And it's just money that will just be draining. Cool, I think I'm just up on about, um, 40 minutes thereabouts. I think it's actually closer to 45 now. Um, I'm happy to answer some questions and I've probably got a few other bits and pieces that I can go through too. So anyone have any questions off the top of their head? So you kept mentioning this tool that makes all the UVs for you. What yeah. Tool was it? Uh, it's called Unrella. Umbrella. Okay. So we use it to do unwrapping. Uh, it's not a perfect tool. It will give you pretty rough results sometimes. Um, but it will give you, it, it's designed to have minimal stretching and keep resolution equal across your unwraps, which is really what we needed at the time. It saved us a lot of money. Again, it really came down to what we were thinking about where it was sort of value for money. In these particular miniatures, they weren't going to animate, they weren't going to bend. The, the, the end user was never going to see it. And so it became a case of why spend the money, why spend the time trying to make something perfect when it, it wouldn't really have a, a great impact on what you were doing. I mean, this is something that we really thought about when we were doing uh, Rogue Singularity, where we were. It was a case of what what is the what is the player going to play and care about versus what do we care about. This can be something again that artists have a problem with. Especially, you can spend a lot of time on you know little things that you you know that you know that those little things that are really important to you but it can very quickly become an expensive, uh, again, an expensive time sink if the player or the user is never gonna see it. Like if you're, if you're spending time working out what the texture looks like on the underside of a chair and the game is top down, do you know what I mean? Like just start thinking about what you're doing and how you're doing it. So one of the, the things that I like to think about is that when we designed a lot of Rogue Singularity, a lot of the design decisions and art decisions were made in concert based on what we wanted to do, based on how we wanted to do them. So we talked about, well, we know the basic premise of the game. What do we want the tone of the game to be? How are we going to use these elements to support the tone? What decisions are we going to make in order to make that easier? How are we going to make it so that the two between two people, we're going to be able to release a game that takes four hours, has full 3D models. We're doing a simultaneous release on PC, Mac, Linux, Xbox and PlayStation next year. 
It's an overwhelming task for a two-man team. And what we did is we created ourselves a tool chain. We created ourselves a style that supports us in being able to do that. So we're adding this week uh, going into probably, the, it's actually probably going to be next week if I'm honest. Um, this week's so busy. So <clears throat> next week we're going to be adding in a whole new type of game mode for the game, which is going to be um, a silly game mode. So what we're doing is we're taking single types of um so the first update is going to be the uh, enemy update and it's going to be nothing but um, monsters everywhere. So we're going to take all of the little monsters that appeared throughout the game and they're all going to be compressed and put into three levels and it's just going to be silly. And it doesn't perform anything other than give the players something a little bit more relaxing to play that's less stressful than the full game and gives them a little bit of fun. And then we're going to be updating th that on a weekly basis. So the next week it'll be nothing but moving platforms. We're also working on putting out secret levels and content updates. And again, that's something that has been reasonably straightforward now that we have a really solid tool chain working. I can create some nice objects. I can put them in the game. I can link them up and I can straight away start seeing eye levels running. I can constantly iteratively play them as I add content. That's actually something else I should talk about is that you want to be able to always keep playing and viewing your game from the perspective that your camera and that your player is going to be at. So when you're designing your art style, really start thinking about how it's going to be viewed. Because it's very easy to like rotate around your character and look at it from all angles and say, isn't it pretty? Or your character up on a big white background and say, look how amazing he looks. If he looks exactly the same as the background, all of that is going to be immediately lost. And you're going to spend a lot of money carefully crafting something that looks extremely busy, extremely... Um, messy and you're going to waste a lot of time and money for something that would have been much more effective if it had been cleaner if it had been neater and this goes through pretty much everything that you do you want to try and think about what you're building you want to try and think about what you're designing as for where it's going to be used and how it's going to be used because it's very easy to look at the prop it's very easy to look at the object that you're making and forget that it has to exist in the world and it's going to actually be somewhere in your environment and when you're just rotating around your object and you're looking at it from very, every, every angle, you can forget that what color does it need to be? What is the color palette of the area? Is it going to stick out? Is it going to light properly? Is it going to be, there are so many factors that go into art that, that transcend just the model outside the game engine. This is always something that, uh, and it's something that I trip up on too often, where it's like, I'll get too focused on what I'm working on and forget that this object has to go in the game and I'm going to have to take a look at it. Sometimes I'll make something that looks really good. It's a perfectly shiny metal and then you put it under the lights in the game and all of a sudden it's pure white. It's so shiny, it's nothing but a mirror. <laughs> and now you have a pure white object in your game. Your bloom settings are causing it to glow like it's on fire. <laughs> and all of a sudden you're like, I didn't think about this. But how much time did I spend making it look that cool metallic without thinking about the lighting systems. Again, this is one of the reasons why I really suggest uh, Substance Designer because it's very good for being able to show your object as you work on it. Unfortunately, this is something that um, in some of the workflows that I've been doing, I've not been able to do, but it is something I hope to be spending a little bit more time working on it. Again, I don't use Substance Designer that much, but I have it because it's a tool and it's useful and it has paid for itself. Even when I'm using it for minor things. Substance Painter, another great program actually one of my favorites. Almost all the grime and gore on our UI elements were done using Substance Painter. I used their particles to slide down and create rust trails and water trails. I did it very quickly. We turned them into 2D image assets and we got them out in about a day. The other thing that I really love doing and is so useful, if you're a 3D modeler, even if you're um, just a, a 2D artist or a Start creating yourself a library of assets that you've created, objects that you've created. If you're not going to, you may not think you're going to use it again. You will want it one day. You'll create the perfect bolt for a game. You'll never use it, and then one day you'll be on another project being, if I only had that bolt I made. It sounds funny, but it's so true. I have in my Dropbox folder now an ever-growing library of objects. I've got five minutes? All right. I have an ever-growing library of objects, and I keep adding to it with new things. Again, when you go online, there are some really nice resources that let you find not asset packs, but actual base 3D models, things for ZBrush. You can get substances for Substance Designer and Substance Painter. Really useful to download them and have them on hand. You just want to keep yourself a really big library of stuff that you're ready to go and hit the ground running. So do we have any more questions? Have you had any luck like using Kit Bashing or other? 
other like procedural art generation techniques for making polished assets? Yeah, I kit bash almost constantly to make my stuff. Uh, in terms of procedurally generating art assets, I don't really do it. I've not seen very many tools that allow you to do that very effectively. There's one really cool one in Autodesk that I've been meaning to use, which lets you set up sort of greebles that you can paint onto a surface. Um, I've not had a chance to play with it properly. I would really love to if I can get the chance. Um, it, it seems a little polygon intensive, uh, which is not necessarily a problem, but no, I kit bash like crazy. So sometimes when I'm building things, instead of building the final, like if I'm building a rock cliff, instead of building just the rock cliff, I'll often just start off by building rocks, lots and lots of rocks. And then I start turning them into brushes and tools. And then I use them to start building the cliffs out of. It can be incredibly powerful. I keep myself a kit bashing library. If I'm making spaceships, I mean, literally start thinking, if you, if you get the chance, there are websites that show you how people used to make, um, you know, sci-fi props and things back in the day. And in a lot of cases, they're just kit bashing the crap out of it. I have things where it's like industrial pipes from a, from a model that I did of a, of a, um, of a, of a oil refinery. And now I need pipes on my spaceship. So whoop, 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 we have big pipes on my spaceship. Like, you, you know, again, I come from having to work very quickly and work very aggressively. So sometimes just kit bashing to get the shape out and then going in and iterating over the top of it can be useful. Again, when I did some of this Warhammer 40K stuff, I literally, I created some skulls. I created a bunch of buttons, some panels. I created eagle decals and all of this kind of stuff and I created a computer screen setup and I just started hitting it with buttons and panels and dials and da 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 and then when that was all done brought it into ZBrush I started adding corrosion over the top of it I made some of the buttons look like they'd bent a little bit I went through and dropped it into substance painter and started dripping water down and and so that it would create rust lines and things it would really help me find the um find the natural shapes of the objects that I was trying to create Cool. Hope that was helpful.